How do you lose a forest? First, you need a forest to lose. A forest like the red pines and white pines that once towered in Minnesota. Trees that had never been logged. Trees so tall you had to crane your head back, and even then you couldn't see their tops. Trees so big two people could hardly wrap their arms around a single trunk. You might think a forest would be hard to lose, but in Minnesota in 1882, a survey crew lost a forest. Hello, welcome to Drawn to Write. I'm your host, Felicia Schneider-Hahn. Our program looks at the work of writers and illustrators and explores the junction where words and images meet. Today, we have Phyllis Root and Betsy Bowen discussing their new project, The Lost Forest. Phyllis Root is a Minnesota writer of more than 40 books, many of them award-winning books for children with a focus on nature. Betsy Bowen is a lifelong artist who has illustrated numerous children's books and works in various mediums in her studio on Lake Superior's North Shore. And welcome, both of you. I'm so excited to talk with you today, uh, mainly because I'm, I'm a fan of both of your works, and I'm trying to be calm about how excited <laughs> I am to see you. <laughs> Thank you so much for having us. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Uh, and I want to say, too, I have uh, three kids. They're nine, seven, and five, and they're very jealous that I get to sit here today <laughs> with both of you. So uh, you've collaborated on numerous projects, but today we're going to focus first on your new book, The Lost Forest. Can you tell me a little bit about the book? Well, it, it actually began farther back, further back. It began with, with One North Star, which was a counting book about Minnesota habitats. And so in the course of that, um, I realized, I'm, I'm not originally from Minnesota, I realized I, I didn't know anything about the bog. You know, that we have more peatlands in Minnesota than any other state except Alaska. So I went up to the big bog, up by Waskish, Minnesota, and, um, and fell in love with the bog. And then on the way back, there was a, something about scientific and natural area, the lost forest, the old growth forest. And so we just sort of stopped there on a whim and it just it was so amazing. And the first tree you come to, your, your kids could not hold hands all the way around it. It's too big, which is astonishing. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that, I think that was the beginning of it, but meanwhile, Betsy and I did a book on the bog and then one on the prairie and then I thought it would be nice to have one on the forest, a kind of a hat trick of Minnesota habitats. And when I thought about the forest, there's so much you can say about the forest. There's so many forests. There's so many kinds of forests, you know, in Minnesota. We're so rich in different sorts of habitats. But I kind of landed on, you know, old growth forest, the lost, the lost 40, the lost forest. In the fall of 1882, Josiah R. King and his three-man crew were hired to survey three townships in the state of Minnesota. If you were trying to turn this rollicking land into straight lines on paper, you might make a mistake. Josiah King did because they misplaced a lake on a map for 76 years and those tall trees kept growing. So it's interesting to me that um, you two don't really talk about the project then. It's not like you went hiking on the Lost 40 and decided we're going to do this book. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, it, it, uh, usually the writer and the artist don't even communicate, may never meet. So I'm very lucky that I know Betsy, but I would mm -hmm. never presume to say, oh, I don't think it looks like that. You know, it's such a collaboration. Um, you know, for the writer, there's your words. And then the artist brings this whole expanded world to it. And I love that. So you trust the art editor, and, and, and I trust you implicitly always, you know, that it would be a beautiful, beautiful book and that you would bring your whole heart to illustrating it. So it is trust, don't mm. you think? Well, I would, yeah, I would think so. I mean, I, I, uh, I mean, I believe that I can do something that's 
going to be worthy of the expectations, so to speak, or just make a cool thing, you know, that's more than the sum of the parts. I, is how I like to think of it. You know, the pictures make the words better, and the words make the pictures better. You know, I'm not a visual person, so I, I don't see pictures, and I don't think about the art or the artist as I'm writing it. I'm just trying to make the words work. Nice. Well, it's a generous thing, I think, to, you know, to offer your work up for the big unknown. Well, we've done four books together, most recently The Lost Forest. Well, we first met quite a while before we did a project together at a Young Writers Conference some years ago. And then it was later that I was contacted by University of Minnesota Press who had acquired a manuscript of hers and they were looking for an illustrator and thought I might be a good match for it. Yeah, it's a very respectful, professional way of doing it. I think that's been common to the projects that I've done. Because there's a little bit of fear of the blank canvas with this idea of like, well, now what are we gonna do to make it super cool? The books that I've done with Phyllis, what I'll do is read it over and over and just imagine um, you know, imagine something and then, you know, ponder it for a little while, a week or two or something, and maybe mess around with little sketches or ideas. And, but for the most part, I th would think it pictures. I mean, I would start seeing some ideas in my mind, like, right away. So to focus on the story of the Lost Forest, tell us, what is the arc for you? What was the story that you really wanted to get across? In the beginning, it was, I want to write about the forest, because the bog is about the plants and animals of the bog. The prairie is about plants and animals of the prairie. Uh, and so I started out writing about the lost forest. Among those tall trees, black bears scratched for grubs, moose drank at creeks, eagles nested, Redback salamanders laid eggs in old logs, and tiny coral root orchids grew. But the forest was lost, and it stayed lost, while those tall trees kept growing taller. There's a big sign at the entrance that tells how it got lost, and I'd been there a couple of times. I knew it had been missurveyed. And that led me into a whole, whole level of research of the cadastral survey, which I had never heard of. Do you know, you fly over the Midwest, you look down, you see straight rows and straight lines, and it never occurred to me how they got there. So I did all sorts of reading on the cadastral survey and how the land was divided up so that it could be sold because the government needed money after the revolution. It had no taxes, it had no income, it had a lot of war debts, and so they had land. But to sell it, they had to sort of standardize the parcels that were going to be sold. So that changed the whole book from being about plants and animals to being uh, more of a social history. For 76 years, those lost trees belonged to nobody but themselves, just as they always had. Fire claimed some of the trees, wind felled others, but most of those tall pines just grew taller and taller. Then, in 1958, someone, probably a forest ranger, noticed those tall trees and a crew came to measure and mark the land. I think the thing I came away with most, and I actually hope people will come away with not only how valuable these places are, but that um, how we measure the land has a lot to say with how we regard the land. You know, as here's my piece, here's your piece, I'll cut my trees down and it won't matter that your trees are still there. Does that make sense? You mm -hmm. know, it's the, the, the sort of um, wholeness of the land gets lost in that. And so that's, I, I hope that people, that's not the point of the book. It's not a message about land. It's about this got lost and then it got found and look what happened and you can still go see it and it matters. Um, but that's a little subtext for me. That was kind of astonishing to think that I'd never thought about that before. 
You know what's really interesting is that when I read this book to my kids, they're nine, seven, and five, that's exactly what we talked about. Really? And oh, you have this good. great line in there about the, the forest wasn't lost, it always belonged to itself. Mm -hmm. And that's what we talked about. Who owns the land? Well, who had the land before? You know, the surveyors came in and we got into that. I mean, there was right. so much to talk about. Who owns the land that we're sitting on right now, you know, in our pajamas um, <laughs> as we're reading this book? And it, I could see the light bulbs going off for them that, oh, who does own land? And, and how do we decide that? And who decides that and why? And it was a really interesting I'm discussion. I'm so glad. That makes me really happy. I, I'm wondering how many more kids will want to go there. After I hope so. Book. I hope so. There's a trail. Yeah. There's a very nice little kind of mile-long trail. And I've never gone off trail. Have you? Um, a little bit, because I wandered down to the wetland, okay. which I think is a little s kind of spur trail that, or informal trail. I mean, the whole place is kind of understated, really, as far as uh, an a, attraction, so to speak. You know, there's a little sign and a gravel parking for space for a couple cars to get off the road and really just an unassuming path and a couple of info signs as you go along. It's really, it's very nice, I think. It's very, um, you know, it's not interrupted much. So yes, I did. I went um, particularly to take pictures and just get the feel of it. You know, it, it just felt to me like I was looking up just so far to see the sky. <laughs> like, like really far. Almost nowhere else in Minnesota had trees like the trees of that lost forest, where the wind blew through the same branches it had blown through 300 years before. All the land around those tall trees was national forest now. Those tall trees were protected forever. And the objects you have, so you have some here with you today. Yeah. And you're outfits. Can you tell us like the objects that inspired you? Yes, I got really interested in the history of surveying too, reading all of this story. And then part of the um, part of it then is I need to dig in to draw the equipment or the whatever, you know, was going on, you know, that um, cuz Phyllis talks about, well, what did they what did they pack to go to camp, you know, what was useful and what how did they do what they do? So I, that was fun to dig into that. So I, I and my dad was a serve. Well, he was an engineer, but he had a surveyor's license as part of that. So in the fifties, I, w when I was a little kid, I helped you know hold the pole that had the numbers on, and he had a brass transit, just the same kind of equipment as uh, Josiah did in um, the eighteen eighties and nineties. So this is a surveyor notebook. I mean, I remember what these. Little notebooks. I've always liked just notebooks. Being a, you know, kid with crayons and pencils and things. And a writer. But, well, <laughs> I, yes, I, yes. I always have a little journal, sketchbook journal thing going. So this has actual pencil notes from the surveyor being out in the field. This one is from the 1940s in Georgia, but it was before the technology changed into um, the satellite and technical way of doing things that we have now. And then um, this is a replica of a, a brass compass. It, fo it all folds up in, into a little case, you know, so it could be transported, because everything they used was really portable. So that was, that was kind of fun to search out the things. I don't have my dad's brass um, transit it anymore, but that was a magical thing. Mm -hmm. You know, we could look through the through it at the moon, and as kids, mm -hmm. and uh, it was there was, you know, it f it fit precisely in a little velvet covered box with compartments that just held it, and it was you know it was clearly like an important device. The surveyors used compasses to find their way. They measured distances with poles and tally pins and chains that were 66 feet long. They carried axes to cut compass bearings on trees. They took notebooks to write the measurements they made. They mapped out townships six miles wide and six miles long. And at every corner of every township and every section and every quarter section, the survey crew cut marks on trees 
or planted posts with bearing marks to locate each piece of land. And you're dressed as a surveyor. I have to ask you about yes. Your... <laughs> this is my this is my um, take on what a surveyor, a land surveyor wore in 1892, based on the photo of Josiah King and his crew. They always had like button shirts, you know, vest, jacket with pockets. Um, there was a thing about a um, sort of a bandana type scarf, but not a red one for unknown reason. Not red. No, no. but you could tie it, well, you know, if it was really buggy, you could, you could tie it around um, yourself and improve your your uh, fortune and um, <laughs> you could I, I mean it was just like that was an essential piece there there were not paper towels there was not you know anything and they had um, they all had boots that laced up just work boots you know sturdy canvas pants nails um, on the bottom they brought oh, extra yeah. nails for fixing their boots and then of course the hat they all had hats, even if the outfits varied a little bit. They all had hats, and um, so I, I looked for something similar to use as my thinking cap for this project while I was working on it. The surveyors wore wool hats, coats with waterproof pockets, roomy pants of sturdy fabric, flannel underclothes and wide-soled boots, and a large silk handkerchief to keep mosquitoes, gnats, and moose flies off their ears and necks. How did you decide for the Lost Forest to go with paint? How did you decide not to go the woodcut route? Well, I thought there was a little bit of deadline drive for that because we'd already postponed it. And uh, woodcuts are slow. They're lovely, but they're slow. That's my. That's the main part of my livelihood, is the um, the the hand done woodcuts. So that's what's mostly in the shop here. But I also thought that these details, like, well, let's see, like these, the surveyor. No, this it was so technical, you know, with the survey notes. Like this is what the historic maps looked like. You know, there's a lot of little line work and it's beautiful. I've always just loved the, you know, the way they shape the letters and whatnot. I was conscious of that from being a, a kid because my dad did that stuff. But then, um, so I thought that the combination of the woods, the woodsy bit, and then the, you know, these little finely drawn details would be really interesting. And the that richness of the and darkness of the woods I thought would would work out well and then um, so what I did what I ended up doing and this was sort of my insight into understanding painting anyway for me uh, was to think of it like a woodcut and so the way that that came about was I started out with black just I painted the whole page black and then um, painted on top then with uh, um, opaque paints. And then I could add lines and draw. It's fun, it's a puzzle, it's the puzzling of it all. And Phyllis, you know, of all the history that you immerse yourself in, um, how do you decide, oh, this is what would be most interesting to tell with this story? You know. How do you sift through it all? Um, I think in part, you know, I, I don't set out to write like history, history. I'm drawn to place, you know, in these books. Um, with the bog, it was like there are these secret places. And with the prairie, it was like the idea, I think, that, you know, we can't bring the prairie back, but you can do these little things that will be really helpful to at least the little creatures that depend on the prairie. Um, and the lost forest, it was the forest belonged to itself. So if, if I don't ever come up with that kernel, I don't think I can make a story work. And you don't know, I don't know going in what that's going to be. It really is 
a process of discovery. The trees had never really been lost. Neither had the orchids, the moose, the warblers, the weasels, the porcupines, the flycatchers, or the flickers. They had always belonged to themselves. But because Josiah King and his three-man survey crew made a mistake, because they misplaced a lake on a map for 76 years, you can walk through time and see the woods as it used to be and still is in the lost and found forest. Well, thank you for sharing your process of discovery with us today, Phyllis and Betsy. Uh, this has been a great time to, to hear about how you work together and um, view your collaboration and, and telling these stories. Thank you, thank you. And thank you for joining us. This has been Drawn to Write, and I'm Felicia Schneider-Hahn. Thank you for coming and spending this time with us, caring about good stories and the collaborative creative process.